Welcome to the Enlightened Musician Podcast, a podcast all about the music business and learning how to turn your art into an equally successful business, flipping the mentality of a starving artist into a profitable, sustainable career. Each week, we will interview someone that is excelling in their field and talk tips and tricks on how you can implement that for yourself. Because honestly, how can you know what you don't know until you've been enlightened? Welcome to another episode of the Enlightened Musician Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Light, and I'm so excited to be back with another episode. As in some of our other episodes, this was actually recorded a little while before COVID. We tried to wait for a little bit and see if everything cleared up, and as we all know, (laughs) nothing cleared up. So just a disclaimer, this is actually before COVID hit, so if you hear things talked about, about us going out into and venturing into the world, this is not now. This is actually pre all of the events that happen. So without further ado, my next guest is John Martin Keith, or as I know him, Marty. He is a singer-songwriter based in Nashville, Tennessee. I'd like to call him the jack of all musical trades. He's a touring artist, having performed in front of thousands from the stage, along with artists such as Stephen Curtis Chapman, Jackie Velasquez, and New Song, among others. As songwriting, he writes multiple genres with some of the top hit makers in Nashville. He also writes and produces songs for TV film, and ads with artists from all over the world. He has currently placed music on CBS, Fox Sports, Discovery Channel, History Channel, and so many more. And not only that, he also has the time to be the owner of Edenbrook Music, which offers guitar lessons, instrumentals, live sound for special events, and booking for other touring artists and music production services. I know, like I said, Jack of all musical trades. And to top it all off, and one reason we are on this podcast together is he has his own podcast, and he's like me. It's about musicians and the heart of musicians and making a career in music, and his podcast is called You Can Make a Living in the Music Industry. So that was a mouthful. I'm excited to finally bring on Marty. All right. Hi, Marty. How are you? I'm very well. How are you today? I am doing so good. I am so excited to have you on the podcast today. And Marty and I actually talked a few weeks back, and I'm going to be on his podcast, which if you guys don't know, is amazing. It's called You Can Make a Living in the Music Industry. Um, And I'm going to actually have you just, you know, start off the conversation with that. Uh, So you have a music podcast. What is that all about? Yeah, well, a few months ago... um, my wife and I have been talking about that idea. So people have been asking me for years. I've been in the music industry for over 20 years as an artist and songwriter and producer and different things. Um, and so my wife asked me, you know, a while back about, uh, possibly doing one because people are always asking me, how do you make a living doing music? Because I do Mm -hmm. all of the, I do a lot of different things in the industry. So like I said, you know, artist, songwriter, producer, I'm a booking agent, I'm a guitar teacher, I'm a worship pastor, you know, I'm just, it's just kind of like nonstop all the time. So like seven or different, eight different things that I, seven or eight different things that I do. Um, and so people ask, you know, how do you do that? Well, it's because I have a lot of different things that I do, not just necessarily one or two, you know, some people have that, that luxury of doing one or two things that can do it really, either really well, or they can make a really good financial living at that. But for the, the majority of us, working class musicians, you know, we have to do multiple streams of income that allow us to do that. And so, um, so between my wife encouraging me to do that, and then also our mutual friend, Kathy Heller, um, with catch the moon music, who that's how you and I initially met was through catch the moon and Kathy doing her, her course for learning how to do or to write sync music. Mm -hmm. Um, she, cause she has a podcast as well. And so she was encouraging me somewhat as well. And so between the two of them and just wanting to, um, to share my, you know, my experience and all the different people that I've met over the years, um, I just felt like it was a good time to do that. And it's been amazing. I've been so blessed to have just some of the most ridiculously crazy, you know, amazing, uh, guests that have been on the show and, you know, people that I would never dream of getting to spend time with, Mm -hmm. you know, outside of that. And it's just opened up a lot of doors to get to meet people, you know, in that, in that way and uh, and to build new relationships and friendships with people. And it's been just a total blast. Yeah. I, 
I love that. And too, I feel like the exact same, um, just getting to meet a whole bunch of new people and getting to talk shop with everyone. And that being said, you talked about your story. I kind of want to go back and talk about how you even got into the music industry and talk about how you split into all those different um, parts of the industry, especially too, because you mentioned artists, sync, booking. So yeah, just tell us kind of how you got to where you are now. Well, the the reason I do all all of those different things is out of necessity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> really. Uh, I'm originally from a town called Paducah, Kentucky, which is in ah. Western Kentucky. It's a two hour. I, I live in Nashville or just south of Nashville in Franklin, Tennessee here. Uh, and Paducah is two hours northwest of Nashville. So it's just it's not too far away. But that's where I grew up. I started taking guitar lessons uh, from a man named Herb Chapman. Mm-hmm. when I was four years old. And so I've been playing literally all my life. And um, he taught me, you know, how to play guitar and how to write music. And, um, you know, I, I'm forever indebted to him for for people who might know who Stephen Curtis Chapman is. If people mm-hmm. know that name, he is a, a Christian music artist. Um, Herb is Herb Chapman is Stephen's dad. And so I grew up around that influence. And Steven has been a huge, for a lot of people will know that, um, who know who I am and know my podcast, that he is a huge influence on my life and been a mentor as well. And so I've kind of tried to model my music and my ministry after what Stephen Curtis has done. But all of that stems back to his dad being just an integral part of my, my life and my musical journey. So, um, so like I said, I started when I was four, taking guitar lessons, you know, been playing, uh, you know, I was out doing like talent shows and, you know, these different types of events when I was in high school and uh, different things like that. And then once I went off to college, I went to, um, I went to Kansas City for a year to a Bible college, actually, mm-hmm. and um, met different people there and ended up working at a youth camp leading worship for a summer. And that kind of launched me into being a worship leader and working with a lot of youth camps for 20 plus years and um, different around the country, different places and a lot of different churches and, and different things like that. And so, you know, just try to narrow this down for you, but you know, after, <laughs> cause it's a long no, story, I'm enjoying it. but a- after that, um, I actually went back to Paducah, ended up teaching and working for, for Herb Chapman for a couple of years and helping run the store and doing a lot of different things there. And then I ended up going back to college um, in Joplin, Missouri at a place called Ozark Christian College and did that for two years and um, had a band, started a band there called Hand to the Plow. And we were out (laughs) playing, you know, um, all the time, you know, and that was a, that was a a really, just a really fun time in life, kind of kind of learning the ropes of, of being in a band with other people and, you know, learning how to work together and create music together. And, um, you know, it's just a really, really good time in life. And after that, I moved to Nashville in the year 2000. So I've been mm-hmm. in Nashville for 20 years now. And uh, I moved to town actually with an internship in place, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I was at Ozark, they, in the music department, someone had put up a flyer saying that there was a, a small indie label in Nashville looking for interns. And since I was coming to Nashville, I was like, well, I'm going to look into that. So um, I got to town, had an interview set up with that label, and uh, and they they brought me on. And so the people that I met, and I think this is such an important, important, important point, is the people that I met at that label as an intern have been my closest best friends ever since. That's fantastic. You know, some of those people are still like my closest friends. And so I think that's important for people to know when you get to, when you get to a town like Nashville or LA or some big music city, um, it really comes down to relationships. And we talk about that a lot on my podcast. It, it really does come down to relationships uh, more than anything. Talent is important. You have to be a great musician, a, you know, a great artist or songwriter or whatever it is that you're, you're trying to do. But it's the relationships that you build with people. They're the ones who are, who are, will end up giving you opportunities that you would not necessarily get on your own. Um, you know, and you're not doing it for that purpose, but 
it's just sort of a natural progression, you know? And so, and the people that when you move in, you're kind of like, when you move to, to a music city and you start connecting with people, you end up kind of becoming your, that's your class, quote unquote, your, mm-hmm. you know, like your high school class or whatever. Like those are the people that you end up raising, you end up rising up in the industry with those people. And so when, you know, a friend gets an opportunity with something, then they might say, Hey, do you want to come do this with me? Or you might get an opportunity and you tell that person, Hey, do you want to come do this with me? And that just starts opening opportunities that you, you know, that each for each other that you wouldn't have had otherwise necessarily. And so, mm-hmm. um, that, that's such an important thing. I think, you know, to say, tell people that they need to know that. And so that was a really big deal for me when I first moved to town and, you know, that got me out touring with an artist for a couple of years, playing guitar and, and kind of, you know, road managing somewhat for that artist. Um, you know, and then, you know, over the years, it's just been lots of touring, lots of songwriting. Um, I'm a guitar teacher. I have a, I have a teaching business called Edenbrook Music. And now Edenbrook Productions is my sort of my umbrella company that I've that I've created over the years, um, which in, encompasses guitar teaching, the artist, songwriting, writing for sync, being a worship, you know, worship leader, um, mm-hmm. doing, I think I said booking, but, you know, kind of all of those things. And again, those things really came out of a necessity of needing, needing to find work because for a lot, a, a long time I was, I was touring part-time and I was a part-time artist. Um, but when I would come home, back to Nashville, you know, I was delivering pizzas for like mm-hmm. six years. Oh, wow. Um, you know, when I was in town, but my schedule was flexible and they would, you know, in, pretty much everyone who worked there was were, were musicians. And so it was very flexible and anyone could, could leave and come back at any time pretty much. So that was really nice. So I did that for a long time. And when I got, my wife and I got married, you know, she was a bass player as well. And so we were going out and touring together and she was playing for me and um you know we come home and then we both worked at at the pizza place together because that's how we met (laughs) and um yeah so it's a fun little story and um but that's kind of in a nutshell you know how I got in how I got into it no I love that and I think a lot of people don't know too because I had a day job before I went full-time in and I worked at a dental practice because the same thing you were talking about it's so much easier to get a job that's really flexible with your music schedule. So you can do a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes certain artists are just kind of focus on one stream and then they don't make it because they don't have enough outside income sources actually helping them pursue. So I love that you're doing, I mean, you're literally doing everything. There's podcasts, there's artists, there's booking, there's sync. You mentioned road manager. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about, you said Edenbrook music. Yes. Uh, Looked at it a little bit. That's a little bit of everything. And Kind of talk a little bit about that and how that's going right now, especially within the booking aspect for other people. Like, how is that? Yeah, it's been, it's been good. You know, I'll say up front, booking, I think is the hardest part of the music industry. Uh, It's, it's hard. It's not, it's not the most enjoyable aspect of what we do, Mm -hmm. but it is an absolutely necessary part of what we do. If, you know, if you're going to be an artist that is out, touring and wanting to be out playing shows, whether it be locally or regionally or nationally or however you want to look at that. Uh, and I, I tour nationally, you know, I go all over the country and, um, you know, some days are closer to home or more regional, but you know, I've always got, I'm always trying to stay, you know, moving out to different places into new places. Oh yeah. You know, but I've got a few different artists that I do booking for in different genres. So I've got, um, a country group, I. I work with, I have a jazz artist I work with, some, um, some Christian music artists and worship artists that I work with. Um, you know, and so it's good. It's like I said, it's, it's hard because Mm -hmm. venues are venues, venues are hard to get them to respond to you, which is, you you would think it'd be really easy Mm -hmm. because this is what they do. Like that's their job is to book artists and bands to come in to play at their venue. But so many times you reach out to them and then they either, they never respond to you they never answer the phone or the emails, they never get back to you. And so you're just kind of like, well, now what do you, 
now what do I do? So you're always having to like find new ways to try to get their attention. But I, I prefer to call people first. And I think, I think when we, when we talked and ha- you were on my podcast, I think we kind of mm-hmm. talked about that as well. Um, but I think that is the most personable way to do it. If you can get someone on the phone and tell them who you are and what you're doing and mm-hmm. the kind of artist you're representing and, you know, and have that conversation, you can start building that relationship again. And that's, again, that's such an important thing. Um, but one of the things I'm working on right now that I'm excited about with a couple of different artists, well, uh, let me take that back. I, I'm working on it with a country group that I work with Yeah, is working on getting them into NASCAR. <gasps> nice. Which Guess I'm a who huge. lives in the NASCAR uh, yeah, That's capital. right. You live in the NASCAR <laughs> capital, don't you? I literally live right next to Richard Childress Museum. Are you serious? So, yeah. That's like awesome. I could, I mean, I wouldn't want to walk there, but I could definitely get in the car and then hop right out. Yeah. So it's well, just right down the street. That's super cool. Like, <laughs> yeah, my family, we're huge NASCAR fans. Uh, we watch it. My daughter and I watch it every Sunday together. And, uh, and they're just starting back. So I'm super excited about that. So that the new season is off and running. Mm-hmm. And, That's um, awesome. So, but anyway, so with that, which is really cool is uh, I'm working on getting this group into doing like their, their pre pre race concerts or post race concerts that they do at different tracks. Um, mm-hmm. so I'm working on that. And then also for me as an artist, because I do, even though I write m- multiple styles styles of songs of music, mm-hmm. as an artist myself, I mainly am a Christian music artist or a worship artist. So, um, but within the NASCAR circuit, there is what's called Raceway Ministries and Motor Racing Outreach. So the Raceway Ministries are each track pretty much has this Raceway Ministries that works with the fans that mm-hmm. are coming. Well, you got thousands and thousands of fans that come to to every race at every track. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but they have chapel services on Sunday mornings because the races are mostly on Sundays. So, uh, so I'm working on getting in to work with them and to come lead worship or do a concert or something like that for these raceway ministries at different tracks. And then also with the motor racing outreach organization, they are um, a ministry that works with the, the NASCAR drivers and their families. They do a chapel service before the race happens and so i'm working with them trying to get in um to to do some of those different chapel services and things like that so that's just something for me that's really cool um yeah it it just makes sense for me because i love nascar and i love worship music and so to get to be a part of it's like the do that mixture (laughs) exactly so those are things that i'm working on with that and then um the jazz artist i'm working with uh, working on trying to get her into different jazz festivals around the country and actually around the world. Uh, they're just kind of all over the place. And so I've been working, you know, working tirelessly trying to make some of those things happen and, you know, but it's been good, you know, lots of different, oh, and also, um, with the, with me and with the country artist as well as working on getting them into major and minor league baseball, um, nice. because, you know, a lot of those teams will do a post game concert you know? Mm-hmm. And so, and they all, and they have theme nights all the time, um, for different things. And they'll have like a country music night or some sort of music concert series that they'll do. And so I'm like, this is just like a perfect fit to make, to get, you know, some of these artists into those things. And then again, for me personally, um, they do a lot of faith and family night events. And mm-hmm. so that's a perfect scenario for me to come in and work with them in that, in that setting as well. So those are the things I've kind of been working on on the booking side of things right now. Yeah, no. And one thing I really want to point out to people listening right now, and I think you're doing very well. A lot of people really only assume that concerts extend to music venues and to bars, wineries, Mm -hmm. and that's about the center of maybe festivals as well. Mm -hmm. But you're really looking outside of the box and seeing what you do and seeing what's needed. So I, I assume a lot of people don't even realize that NASCAR has pre-game, uh, pre-shows, which we have a lot of the different uh, local uh, baseball, basketball, all of those that are especially in the bigger leagues have pre, like pre-concerts and then they have like after-party concerts right. as well. Yeah. So I love that you're looking outside of the box because the thing is, 
a lot of people are probably not reaching out to those people. So your chances of getting it is a lot bigger. Um, but I actually know someone that plays some of the NASCAR things. So after this, I'll uh, give you their info because they <laughs> awesome. used to do that um, that's cool. with another artist. So oh, I'll tell you great. that artist afterwards. Yeah. I'll be hush about it though. Yeah, but cool. that's that's amazing. I think that'd be a great. And country's huge in this area as well. So I, yeah. I'm excited for you on that. Well, it doesn't work for me very well, but it works for everyone sure, else. Sure. And one of the things that I was actually at a meeting earlier this morning and talking with um, a guy about this, he was asking me about the booking stuff as well. And I told him, you know, f- for me, what I think is really cool, the way that I'm going about it is I'm, I'm finding venues that have built in audiences already. I mean, you got thousands of people coming to a NASCAR race or, you know, hundreds or thousands of people coming to, to baseball games, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and so, excuse me. And so if you can get, if you can get an artist into a place that has a built in crowd for you, Mm -hmm. like that is such an easier sell than trying to go to, you know, a a venue, a club or something like that, where you have to sell tickets or, you know, or, you know, pay at the door or whatever it is and trying to, yeah. trying to build an audience. Well, I can bring 50 people or I might be able to get a hundred people there or whatever. When you've got an automatic thousand plus or tens of thousands of people or whatever it is, you know? And so it's just a different perspective of how to do that. Now, one of the other things I do with the booking is, is trying to get all of these artists into doing like, um, like riverfront festivals and Mm -hmm. county festivals and city festivals and different things like that. Again, built in audiences that are looking for music. They're looking for, for bands and artists to come play these things, you know, strawberry festivals. And like, you know, you, you hear that those terms, you think, well, that sounds kind of goofy, but these are, it's not, (laughs) not, it's not at all. Um, you know, you think, you know, uh, you know, cucumber festival, what, whatever it is. Like there's some silly names. It seems we like, have a but. mullet festival in North Carolina. So everything, yeah. you know, it's fish, but still. Right. <laughs> but there's an audience for all of those different things, you know, and they're annual. They happen every year and there's always need for music for these, mm-hmm. um, for these events. And so if we can get bands and artists into these, into these types of venues that have these built in audiences, you know, and you can just share their music with whoever's doing the booking, you know, and they see that the, that the music is amazing, that the artists are, are already having success in what they're doing, then it's, you know, it's a win-win. So that's no, how, I, that's I, been I, my approach in it. No. And I think one point too, is that's actually when I started doing like festivals and different built-in crowds, I built a good chunk of my audience that came to those shows when I did need the number count, like music venues and whatnot. I actually like garnered those at f- built-in crowds mm-hmm. that had the people that weren't coming for me, were coming for something else. And then just, you know, I was a good surprise there. And like you said, with the different festivals, if you have good music, everything else is going to you know, materialize after that via people enjoying you and starting to follow you and, you know, you get your kind of crowd built from there. So I like that approach as yeah. well. And it's a different way to think of it. Yeah. Um, I know earlier you talked about Nashville. I kind of would like to talk about your experience being there versus Kentucky. And if you felt like that really helped your career as well, because a lot of people are thinking about Nashville for the move. And I know a lot of people would love to hear your perspective, especially being there. You said 10 years now, right? Uh, 20. 20 so 20 years yeah after moved, 20 years you should know yeah i should <laughs> i should know um yeah i moved here in 2000 so this is this is uh 2020 now so um it's crazy i know i think that all the time like oh <laughs> i know it's, i know um yeah i love nashville i mean ever since i was four or five years old i knew that i was going to live in nashville and do music for a living i mean when i was five my dream was to play electric guitar for someone on the Grand Ole Opry. Like that was my dream at five years old. Um, you know, my path has since gone a different direction and I have not played on the Grand Ole Opry, but yet, <laughs> not yet. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it may happen. Um, and I've got lots of friends who, who do play on the Opry all the time. Yeah. So, um, but being from Kentucky, I mean, which one of the cool things from about Paducah is that there are actually a lot of musicians and artists and songwriters from Paducah and the surrounding area from Western Kentucky that have been very successful in the music mm-hmm. industry. 
and that have made the move to Nashville. And, um, you know, so I'm very blessed to be, to be included, you know, in that, in that group of, of writers and artists and things. So, um, you know, I think Nashville is a great place to move. Um, it's just a great place to live for one, but if you're wanting to make, if you're wanting to make a living in the music industry and you're wanting to, you know, if you're wanting to be either at a label or a publishing company, something on the business side, Mm -hmm. um, or a staff writer, songwriter, um, those types of things, you have to be in a music city of some sort. Now, whether or not that's Nashville, that determines, that's determined by what genre of music I think you want to play. Mm-hmm. I agree. Um, you know, if you're going to do country, yes, you need to come to Nashville. You know, LA is not going to be, LA, Chicago, New York are not going to be country music places. I mean, we are the country music capital of the world. We're also the Christian music capital of the world. So if you're wanting mm-hmm. to do either of those two genres of music, um, Nashville, it really is the best place to be for that. You know, um, I think if you're doing, um, if you're doing grunge, if that, you know, or alternative rock or whatever, you know, Seattle obviously is a good place for those things. If you're doing pop, you know, New York and LA and, um, you know, so every, every music city has its flavor to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think Nashville is where you want to be for a country or Christian. Now, th- let me, I say that, but there is, there is a growing rock scene here. Yeah. I've heard about that too, Um, which people are trying to convince me because, you know, half of my, even my college booking agency is like, please move to Nashville. Oh yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And actually, so Mark, are you talking about Mark Miller? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, which is funny because actually he's been on, I know he's your booking agent. He's a friend of mine. He's been on. He's been on the podcast, on my podcast. and I love uh, it. I can't wait to hear that episode. Yeah. And it was, oh man, it's phenomenal. It's such, such good information, uh, which you already know all of it, but for, for listeners. It's going to be a good one. You should listen to it. For yeah. Sure. So, but, you know, again, coming to Nashville, if you're wanting, especially if you're wanting to be in, in the business side of things, mm-hmm. you know, you, you really need to be in a music city. Now, as an artist, if you're just, you know, if you're wanting to go out and, and just tour, um, I don't think you have to be in a music city to do that because, and I say that because, um, so many, I mean, most artists that you know of that people listen to on the radio or CDs or MP3, whatever, you know, they're signed to a record label that's either in Nashville or LA or Chicago, New York, whatever. But, they're not from those places, right? They come from small town, USA, whatever, wherever. And then there are tour and they're touring all over the country regardless, you know? So these, the music city becomes their home base, Mm -hmm. but they're still going out touring all over the place. And whether it be nationally or if it's just kind of locally or regionally, if that's what you're wanting to do, but you're like, I don't, you know, I don't want to move to a music city. I don't think you have to do that. If, if um, you can do it independently, yeah. you know, but if you're wanting to be signed to an actual record label or you're wanting to be signed to a publishing company, you really have to be, I think you really do have to be here. And I think that's a good thing to point out too, especially just aligning with what you want to do. So if you want to be within the industry, you kind of need to be where the industry is at. But I know I agree with you on the artist route. Um, and I was talking to someone the other day on a podcast episode where they were touring so much that they were maybe I think that they had moved to Atlanta cause that's a big R and R and B and right, um, yeah. area. And they said they were there for 30 days out of the year and they were paying this outrageous rent. So, you know, like within the artist realm, sometimes you got to see what's the best fit, but sometimes it's timing as well because, you know, I might still live in North Carolina, but I am in LA probably every couple months and Nashville every other couple months as well. So I'm constantly having to be back there. So I think that's just something you have to know that you're going to have to be in these cities, even if you don't live in them. But if you want to be in the industry part, uh, right. you need to live in one of them. So I right. think that's a good thing to talk about too. Yeah. And, and again, from, from earlier, you know, one of the things that, that I've had guests say repeatedly on my podcast is that, you know, again, it comes back to relationships. Well, you mm-hmm. can't you can't build relationships unless you're in 
these cities yeah. around people that are doing the same thing that you're trying to do. You know, that's how you're going to, you're going to raise up with these other people and build each other up. And that's, you know, it's like boats, boats float together, right? They, they yeah. come up together. And so, um, rise of the tides, rise. Yeah. Rise of the tides. <laughs> and so that's, a that's a really an important thing. And I've had multiple, multiple people that have been on, on my show talk about that, that very thing. Um, you know, so if you're wanting to be in one of these cities to do music, you know, that's an important anchor is, mm-hmm. is to be able to do that. Yeah. I think that's the one thing on all the podcast episodes that I did not realize would be as um, talked about was everything leads up to networking and relationships. Mm-hmm. And that really is the focus of everything within booking, within music, within industry. So I think that's very poignant. Uh, one thing that we haven't talked about yet. And congratulations, by the way. Was it on American Greed that you just got your recent placement? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. <laughs> congratulations just, on that. Thank you. So we haven't talked about that side with you. Uh, yeah. Kind of how did you – well, obviously, we kind of heard at the very first how you started getting into sync. But is that actually how you started getting into sync was taking – or so, have you already kind of done it? Um, okay. So when I first got into the sync world, one of – one of the guys, again, going back to when I first moved to town and, and got the internship at that indie record label, mm-hmm. one of the guys that was working there already um, became really good friends with and had you know, been friends f- for 20 years. And so about five or six years ago at this point, um, he was already writing music for TV and film like on a regular basis. And, uh, we had been kind of out of contact with each other for a while and we we got reconnected and I I just flat out asked him, I was like, you know, Hey, would it, would you be interested in letting me come, you know, maybe write something with you for some TV stuff? I really want to get into that, into that world. And, uh, you're already doing it. He's like, yeah, sure. Come on. So, you know, we started doing that together and he's really big into writing music for the TV show, the the soap opera, the young and the restless. (laughs) Nice. And so, we started writing together and my actual first uh, first placements were on The Young and the Restless. And this was like, I think 2017, I want to say 2017, 2016 mm-hmm. maybe, um, is a couple of Christmas s- instrumental songs that we had, that we had done. And um, so that was super exciting. I finally, you know, kind of got into that world and started, you know, every year they've, they would use that same song couple of songs you know every year since then pretty much and then they started writing you know they started requesting you know the the licensing agency that we were going through um to write for them was asking us to say you know hey we need we need different genres of music like this we need sort of jazzy kind of stuff we need um bossa nova kind of stuff and so we would start writing different types of genres for them and we'll get you know more placements doing that kind of thing so we're doing that. And then he was also writing for music libraries, which is different mm-hmm. than sync licensing agencies Very. for, for people who listening, who don't know the difference. So it's kind of two sides of the same coin. So one side is the sync licensing, which you and I do. That's where, you know, for listeners, when you hear a song that you, you would hear on the radio, that you, that sounds like it would be on the radio that you hear on a TV show of some sort, that's sync licensing. They're paying an upfront fee to license your song that sounds like something that'd be on the radio, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Um, the other side of that coin is music libraries. And so a music library is basically all of the instrumental underscore music that you hear underneath dialogue on especially reality shows. You know, any kind of discovery channel, history channel, um, you know, cable, love and hip hop, you know, VH1, any of that kind of stuff where all this instrumental music that's kind of setting the tone underneath dialogue is usually coming from a music library. And so uh, he was doing that with a couple of companies. And so that, again, that got me connected into them. We were, since we were writing, writing together anyway, they were, you know, licensing our stuff. And that opened up a door for me to be able to start working with them on my own. Mm-hmm. And um, I started getting places, you know, placements on my own from that. And so my first, first few uh, 
placements were on history and discovery channel with some of those things. Um, and then, you know, started working with new companies, new libraries, you know, since that, and it's just, you know, working with three or four different ones that I can, can send music to now and they request, you know, they'll send me briefs and request different types of, of music. And, and the thing is with music library music, it's usually only like a minute and a half to two minutes, maybe two and a half minutes is kind of like the average, um, average length of one of those types of songs. And, you know, when you, when you do music for that, you have to do like five different versions of the song. They want five different, you know, they want a full version. Um, they want stems that just have, you know, part of the instruments, um, you know, then they want one that's got even less than that. You know, some companies will say a narrative version, um, which is just underneath the full version. It's like taking out the melody. Then they'll say we want a bed version, which is taking out most of the percussion. It is just basically like pads and ambient type stuff. Um, but you've got to send all of that information in. So it's a little different process and how it's and how it's done. Um, but the American Greed thing that you just mentioned, I just found out about that. That was on CNBC. And that's the that's a new network and new and new show for me to get on. Now the, the way that it works though for your listeners is that okay, so there's um, there's a company that I, I write for, and so they'll request you know certain genre of music, and so I'll send them a song, and they'll put that in their library, and then they've got the ability to send that song to multiple shows and networks that they work with as opposed to just one me sending me sending it directly to one show i send it to them and then they've got like multiple shows and multiple networks that they can then place that song on on your behalf and so you know i've got the same song that has been on probably three or four different shows you know, and it might be a different clip. It might be a different length of the song, you know, but, um, you know, I've got stuff on, there's a show called Amanda to the rescue on animal planet, <laughs> which is like a dog, a dog rescue show. And, um, so that's been fun, you know, and they get played over and over and over. So that's where, you know, that's where it comes in, comes in handy is that on the back end royalties, <laughs> yep. when, when a show gets played multiple times and then, you know, that's where you start kind of snowballing, you know, your, your royalties and that kind of thing. Yeah, no. And that's the best part. <laughs> Hopefully. The back Especially it's tricky. if the show does well too. Yeah. I mean, it's tricky with, with cable. Cable really doesn't pay very well. Yeah. Um, you know, if you, when I, we get a song on the Young and the Restless on, which is on CBS, which is network daytime TV, mm -hmm. you know, that's a, that's a pretty good payout on the back end, uh, just on the royalty side. But then once that same episode plays on either online mm -hmm. or on, um, I think there's a network called Pop. Yeah. And well, I guess which is owned by CBS. When that, and they'll play like reruns of that, of that show. And so if they play The Young and the Restless on CBS daytime and it make, makes that initial um, placement, well, once that, same episode plays at night on pop on cable it's like a fraction of what you got you know and it's just the way it works you know it's a very complicated process which is a whole other podcast in and of itself <laughs> i know, you know i'm thinking about doing a breakdown because i had another artist come on that does sync lighting you know that's pretty much their whole entire deal yeah. and i know there was I, we could talk for hours so i think that's something a lot of people would love to hear too so i'll have to think about doing that sometime but yeah, that's that's so cool that you're getting to do that too, and you're you really are dipping into every every field, and I think that's a fantastic thing to tell our listeners as well is that you don't have to focus just on one thing. You can focus on a lot of different things that all you know react to each other and all can help out in the long run. Sure. But one of my favorite last questions to ask uh, is actually for you. Okay. If you were just starting out or advising the younger you, what would be um, some like useful, what's the best advice that you would give them starting out with the best advice you've heard? It doesn't even have to be within the music industry, but just something that would help towards it. Um, that's a good question. 
And I've gotten so many different answers and it's been really great to hear. I yeah. like the question. Well, for me personally, I'm, I'm a Christian. That's first and foremost for me. As far as, you know, the music aspect goes, if I could tell myself, my younger self, what I know now. Yeah. Uh, and what other people have maybe taught me, you know, again, I think it kind of comes back to relationships. Knowing if I knew then how important the relationships would be in my life that mm -hmm. that they are that I know they are now, I think that would probably redirect some of my thinking and some of my my actions that I made earlier on in life when I first moved to Nashville. Um, I think that's important is, you know, knowing who your friends are and knowing who to stick with and maybe who to let go of, uh, who yes. don't have your best interest in, in mind. Um, and being okay with that, you know, yeah. uh, I'm, it's really hard for me when I, I've lost friendships over the years. And that's a really hard thing for me. I, I take that very personally. So um, that's something that I've struggled with over the years is knowing that a relationship that was really strong and, you know, people that have been like brothers to me that I no longer have any connection with. Um, you know, those things, it, it, if I could have, if I could go back and say, okay, don't do this. Let's figure a way around this so that we don't lose those, those things. Um, I would do that in a heartbeat, you know? Yeah. So, um, music and, and musically, one of the things that is for me, again, you know, 20 years looking back is that I never knew how to reach out to like publishers mm -hmm. when I first came to town. Um, and, or record label people, you know, I never knew how to get my foot in the door doing those things. Now, 20 years later, you know, I'm able to do that partly because of doing my podcast. Um, but also, you know, so I can reach out to people in ways that I couldn't. And I know people now that I didn't know back then. So it's a little bit different perspective, but you know, if, if I could take the advice that <laughs> people have been you know, some of my guests have been giving me, you know, that, yeah. that's why I do the podcast now, because it's like, oh, if I can, if I can f make a fraction, you know, take a fraction of the time that it took me and give that information to someone else mm -hmm. that will help them to not have to take 20 years to figure out what it's taken me to figure out, then, then I, I think I've, then I've helped somebody, <laughs> you know? I completely agree on you there, especially starting out you really are kind of like the only one you have to figure out everything on your own. So mm -hmm. kind of making sure people don't have to go through that same and walking through steps they didn't have to. It's yeah. awesome. And very awesome. Yeah. And another thing is no one is going to, no one is going to believe in you like you're going to believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. It You know, it doesn't matter if you're Carrie Underwood and you've got this amazing team of managers and labels and, executives and whatever, uh, you know, around her, you know, they're all, everyone's got an invested interest. It has, everyone has a vested interest in who she is and what she does because they make all, she makes all of them tons and tons of money. Yeah. Right. But she has to believe in herself more than those people believe in her. Right. Yeah. And um, so I think that's really important is always keep believing in yourself. And, you know, at the same time, be willing to take advice from people. You know, if, if you're not a great singer and you're wanting to be a singer, but you're not a great singer, then mm -hmm. be willing. <laughs> and this is hard. Th this is a hard one. Um, cause this is, there's been different aspects for me, not necessarily the singing part, but just different things and you know, in the industry that I've had to be like, okay, this is not what I'm great at, but I'm really great at this. Yeah. And so I've had to be, be willing to shift my focus and my, my, um, my goals to something other than what I thought I was going to be doing, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think that's another important thing is, you know, maybe you're not great at this particular thing, 
but you're really, really good at this. And if you can have someone encourage you to do, to look at this perspective and go down this path, as opposed to one that you're hoping for Mm -hmm. again, which is really hard thing to do. And it seems selfish because this is, you know, this is what I want to do for a living. You know, I want to be a singer. I want to be a songwriter. Well, I'm not, you know, but you're not a great songwriter, but you're not a great singer. You know, there's people that are just going to blow you away. You know, so for example, let's say, okay, you're a mediocre singer, but you're Mm -hmm. a killer songwriter, right? Yeah. Then, okay, there needs to be someone that's willing to tell you, you know what? Let's focus you on the songwriting. Let's get you a publisher or let's get you writing for some other artists or doing something because that is your strength and you're really, really good at that. You know, you're not a great singer. I love you. You're not a great singer, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but I mean, people, because people are, people quit. People walk away from the music business all the time because their dreams have been shattered because someone didn't, mm-hmm. you know, said they weren't good enough or whatever. Well, okay. And that might be true, but you know, it doesn't mean you can't be really good at something else, you know, but it's not, it's not letting, it's not going by what your, your mom and dad say or what your family says. They always Mm -hmm. think you're the best at what you do, (laughs) you know, (laughs) but that's not how the industry works. So, yeah. So those are just a few things. If hopefully that helps. No, and I love that. And I like, especially just leaning into what you're really good at and not trying to open doors with the key that you weren't given. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, So I really love that. And I want to, before the end of the episode, can you guys uh, just tell us all, because I know you have so many other websites. If you could just give us the links to the different website platforms with your podcast, your website, and then also your music website or whatever you'd like to give. Yeah. Um, So... The podcast is called You Can Make a Living in the Music Industry. So if you just search that, Google search that, it'll and pop up. And I'll put up. it in the show notes as well, sure. people. So if you're if you're driving. Yeah. I mean, I'm my website for that is it's hosted on Podbean. So I think it's, you know, you can make a living in the music industry dot com slash podbean, something along that nature. <laughs> yeah, you have to I'll put it in the show notes. I'll find it. I got you um, guys. That's like the initial thing, but you know, it's on, it's on, um, Apple podcasts and iTunes and Spotify. If you just search that title in any of those platforms, it'll pop up. And, um, in my artist website, because my artist name is my full name is John Martin Keith. So if you go to johnmartinkeith.com, then that's my, my music website that people can listen to and listen to some music and bio and tour dates and all those types of things. Um, and you know, I'm on Facebook and Instagram as well, uh, under my artist name. And then also the podcast, um, you can make a living in the music industry has a Facebook page as well. So you can like, you know, like that page and follow along there. And, um, you know, but yeah, I'd love to, you know, have some of your listeners come over and I want my listeners to come over to to yours. I love that we're doing again, kind of doing the same, same thing. Um, it's just a, another voice, just reiterating, uh, reiterating. Yeah. You know, no, what, I completely what agree. And I, I, for any of my listeners listening, this is a very good podcast as well. And you're going to learn triple the amount because you're just refocusing and redirecting on everything that you listen to and every expert that's already kind of went ahead of you, what they're talking about. So I love just having both of us on different sides and bringing a lot more people in. So I, really appreciate you coming on. And I feel like we've learned so much, especially because you've done it all. <laughs> so, well, so have you, you've done, you've done quite a bit yourself. I th- it's so funny. I think, uh, I feel like a mirror image of certain things that you've done because I'm about it too. I love to put my hands in every part of the industry and yeah. So <laughs> I don't meet yeah. a lot of other people that want to do all that as well. So, well, you know what, let me, let me say this, uh, just to kind of go back when you're saying, you know, if I could, things that I could learn, for, you know, tell my younger self. Mm-hmm. One of the things that, you know, I tell people all the time now, especially through the podcast is be good at multiple things. Mm-hmm. Learn, learn multiple aspects of the industry, of the business, you know, because especially as, as independent artists, if you're not signed to a label, 
and you don't have a publisher that's out pitching your music for you and you don't have a marketing team and you know all these you know a team of people that are doing what those things those people do for signed artists as an indie artist you have to be able to do all that stuff yourself so you have to be creative you have to be the songwriter you have to be the artist you have to be the producer you have to be the engineer you have to be the booking agent you have to be the artist out touring you have to be the road manager you have to be the artist manager you have to be the promotions person you have to be the marketing person you, you know what i'm saying so exactly. you you've got to know how to license your music you got to know how to register your music with your pro you have to know you know all of those things that that sign artists have teams of people doing you have to do that yourself as an indie artist so learn those things and you don't have to be perfect at them mm -hmm. but you at least need to have an understanding of how they work otherwise you're going to get eaten up somebody's going to take advantage of you for one. Oh my gosh yes you know or there's someone, there are 20 people or more waiting behind you to take your place, yeah. you know, that, that do know how to do all those things that you don't know how to do. So I think that's a really important lesson. No. And I love that. And I think that's why both of us have, are full time yep. because you have to just do everything and be everything until it's a necessity to pass some of those things on to someone else, like within the record labels, those people most of them were already doing that prior to being signed. So a lot of people just see that and think it's glamorous and that they just took over and they are doing everything for them. But I promise you, like you said earlier, no one was looking out for them as hard as they were looking out for themselves yeah. because no one cares as much as they do. And it just finally got to a point where someone else could take it over for them. Right. So, and the reason that they it. got the reason they got signed to a label more than likely is because the label saw that they were out doing all that stuff yeah. on their own anyway. And so they see someone's out making it happen and taking, you know, taking control of their career. And then one of the great things that um, one of my guests on, he's the, he's an A&R guy at a record label, uh, Blaine Barkas. He said okay. that, um, yeah, he's the A&R for Provident Label Group. Um, he said in our interview that a record label is really the engine that can just spark, uh, I, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> He's like, you know, a record label is basically an engine that can help, you know, fuel the fire for what an artist is already doing. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? You yeah. know, and I thought that was a great, um, you know, it was a great, a great thing that he said there. It's like, that makes total sense. If an it artist does. is already out doing that, you know, a label is just going to, just going to, you know, add fire to that what's already happening. Yep. You know, so. If you're doing nothing, you know, you can't really spark much of nothing. Right. So you got to give them something to jump off of. Yeah. So, and you want it to be as big as you can make it personally, you know, yourself until you can get to that step. So I do like that. I agree yeah. completely. There's so many good, useful tips and tricks, right? Just within the very end of this episode. <laughs> sure hope so. I love it. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate it, Marty. Thanks so much for coming on. You're very welcome. Thank you for letting let me come on, and thank you for. I know we've gotten to write together and do some do some music together, and um, for sync stuff. And so I'm I'm just grateful for you and for what you're doing, and um, I'm glad to be to be a part of, of the story. Yeah, and I probably will put a little bit of our song at the end if you're cool with it too. Please do. I Sounds would love for good. people to hear it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to take us out with a little bit of that song. Awesome. Take care, you guys. Thanks so much. I've been away for so long, but I'm coming back. They try to pull me down to where they're at. All your words, those words are beautifully. Watch me, watch me set this world ablaze. Because it just keep moving on.
Thank you for joining us this week on the Enlightened Musician Podcast. Make sure to visit our website, theenlightenedmusician.com, where you can subscribe to the show on your platform of choice so you'll never miss an episode. Until next time, this is Lauren Light.